بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له إله الأولين والآخرين وقيوم السماوات والأرضين وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وخليله وأمينه على وحيه أرسله إلى الناس كافة بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراج منيرا صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه الذين صاروا على طريقته في دعوة إلى سبيله وصابروا على ذلك وجاهدوا فيه حتى أظهر الله بهم دينه وعلى كلمته ولو كري المشركون وسلم تسليم كثير أما بعد أيها المحبة We've reached the last part in our study of this magnificent piece of work and comprehensive book in fiqh and hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa La Alaihi Wasallam in Bulug al-Maram and we reach the last section of the text the last kitab of the text kitab al-jami' the comprehensive book and in this comprehensive book it comprises those or some ahadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam regarding comprehensive issues such as good manners. And we talked about in our last lesson, in the last bab that we studied, we talked and gave an introduction about good manners in general. And so now we will talk about the specifics as is contained in Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani his book Bulug al-Maram. And he begins the first bab with good manners and talking about good manners or those ahadith of the Prophet وسلم, that deal with good manners. And then the next subject with, that is contained in this comprehensive book deals with the ties of kinship. So it shows us that there is a relationship, of course. All of this is from adab and from manners and talking about the issues of good manners in general and some of those specific adab. Islami, some of those Islamic mannerisms in which we must practice and embrace is that which relates to the ties of kinship. And then the Imam went on to give the next chapter which deals with piety, bir. So being pious and what that entails in accordance with some of the ahadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And then the Imam begins to talk about those characteristics which are madhmum, those negative characteristics and the ahadith or some ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which talk about those negative characteristics or evil conduct. And those evil con the, that evil conduct are those things which negate good manners. 
those things which are the opposite of good manners and if you will we could say negative and evil manners and evil ways of dealing with people and before we get into the ahadith I want to mention what Imam bin Uthaymeen rahmatullahi alayhi rahmatan wasiya what he said uh, with regards to this comprehensive book and then what Imam bin Baz highlighted with regards to this comprehensive book as these great Imams of our time rahimahumullah jami'an that they left pearls of knowledge and fruits of knowledge as they studied the text of our Salaf, the Salaf of this Ummah, and they relayed what they understood with the fiqh and ahkam that they understood and left these jewels for us to partake in and to benefit and carry and practice. Ben Uthaymeen, rahmatullahi he says in the introduction of the Kitab al-Jami', the comprehensive book, Bab al-Adab, the chapter of manners. He says, rahmatullahi rahmatun wasi'ah, he mentions that adab, no'an, manners, is of two types. Adab ma'Allah wa adab ma'ibadillah. Fal adab ma'Allah huwa qiyam bi ta'atihi wa ta'zimuhu azza wa jal wa ala yataqaddam al insan bayna yadayhi fi tahlil haram o tahrim halal o ijab ma lam yujibhu ila ghayri dhalika min al adab wa kadhalika la ya'si Allah azza wa jal la sirrin ولا أعلن لأن الذي عصاه لم يتأدب مع الله عز وجل. Imam bin Uthaymeen rahmatullahi said with regards to this comprehensive book and this chapter of good manners, he said that manners is of two types. There is manners adab مع الله. There are manners which relate to how you Deal with your Lord, if you will. You know, the conduct you should have with regards to your Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then there is the adab with the rest of the creation. And most of the ahadith that we're going to study are dealing with adab with regards to the rest of the creation. And they conform to the adab that you have with Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says that manners with Allah... They are that you adhere to his commands and you exalt him, the Almighty, and that a person does not give preference to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preferred by making the unlawful lawful or the lawful lawful or the lawful unlawful. Or making that which is not an obligation, making it an obligation. So this shows us the importance of habit of of what? Of the, it shows us the danger of istihlal. Istihlal refers to making the, that which is unlawful lawful. Or that which is lawful unlawful. So we can't make this halal and this haram. This is why it's a very serious thing when it comes to making ahkam. And why we refer back to our scholars, why right? we refer back to the ulama. Some people want you to rush and make a hukum, a ruling on someone or on something. This is halal, this is haram. How come you don't know the answer? No. But from wara, from having from uh, any kind of piety and God-fearfulness, the person will refer to those people who know. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us in the Quran, Ask the people of knowledge if you don't know. 
So this is why from Wara, from Taqwa, from the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in part in the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is regarding taqwa, isn't it? Why? Because taqwa, what is taqwa Allah Azza wa Jal? Taqwa Allah Azza wa Jal is fi'l al awamrihi wa tark uh, uh, ma'asiyati. 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 That taqwa Allah Azza wa Jal, fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that you adhere to his commands and you leave off his prohibitions. And because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us in that ayat, fas'al ahli dhikr. Ask the people of knowledge. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us a command. Al amr yufidu wujub. But he made it conditional. Fas'al ahli dhikr and kuntum la ta'alamun. If you don't know. So that's the condition. If you don't know, ask the people of knowledge. If you do know, okay, you can share to the degree that you have knowledge of that. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us and to, to, to ask the people of knowledge. And that is from the Adab, Ma Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you do not violate his commands and transgress his prohibitions or boundaries. And from the Adab, Ma'Allah bin Uthaymeen mentions is that the person, the servant, does not disobey the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not openly and not privately. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us of our many, many sins. Because we know this, but yet we transgress the bounds easily. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon us. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. And he, he says, because that is, that disobedience to Allah... The person who is disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, lam yata'addib ma'Allah. They're not being, uh, they are not showing the righteous and proper conduct with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is not the conduct you should have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're violating that. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us of our many sins. Ameen. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Then the Imam, he says, وَمِنْ أَدَبْ مَعَ اللَّهِ أَنْ يَتَأَدَبْ مَعَهُ Subhanahu wa ta'ala bima yata'addib bihi ma'anas. So, uh, Ben Uthameen also mentions that from the manners or the mannerisms of how you uh, conduct yourself with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that you conduct yourself with the law as you would conduct yourself with people meaning not in ibadah and things like this but meaning for example Ibn gives us the example for mithlin al-insan yastahi and yakshaf awratuhu amam al-nas wallah ta'ala ahaqqa an yastahya an yastahya minhu hadha idha lam yakun Lihaja. So Ben mean he gives an example for us. He says, and from that adab, from the, those manners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, an example is that a person would be shy to expose their their aura or their their um, their private parts, the things that should be covered on them, in front of other people. And Allah is more deserving that you have shyness with regards to him in exposing yourself. Unless there is a hajjah, unless there's a need. So here the imam is letting us know that from the adab, the mannerisms that we have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that we also, those things which we are shy to do in front of people, we are shy with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as I mentioned in the beginning, that part of the adab that you have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the conduct, is that the way in which you have conduct with other people, that falls under the adab with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it's from the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as he, the Imam says, ahaq, mean Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more deserving that you are shy with him with regards to these uh, mannerisms. So then the Imam, he then mentions that the main point that he's trying to drive home here is that 
being having these manners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the edit with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that you are obedient to his commands and exalting him and exalting his commands and that you, and and respectful and obedient in accordance with his sharia with his sharia with his laws and legislation and that which comes from the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam the second point that Imam Ibn Uthaymeen rahmatullahi wa wasiya that he mentions with regards to the adab ma Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the adab ma ibadillah fuhuwa fi'lun ma yujamiluhu wa yuzayinuhu wa ijtinab ma yudannisuhu wa yushinuhu ay يفعل كل ما يجمله ويمدح ويمدح عليه وكل ما يوافق المروءة. بن أثيمين mentions that the adab with uh, the creation of Allah subhanahu wa taala with the ibad Allah those people uh, you know other human beings and uh, other uh, from from the creation, which falls under the uh, the adab ma Allah subhanahu wa taala, because Allah subhanahu wa taala has commanded these things. So the way in which we have adab or the proper conduct reserved for how we deal with one another, <clears throat> then these are actions which uh, are beautified, and that they uh, make us. They're praiseworthy actions and avoiding those things which cause us hum uh, to be humiliated and that are our negative uh, consequences and negative conduct. And he said, this means to do actions, all those actions which beautify a person and cause a person to be praised and those things which are in accordance or agreeance with uh, honorability and generosity with being honorable and, 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 and good so this is very important for us to have this understanding that the way when we talk about good manners adab and what is mainly going to be dealing with in uh, that we'll be dealing with in these ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in this kitab al jami is that these are ahadith which are showing us how to have beautiful, how to beautify ourselves through actions with our behavior and conduct with one another. So for example, when we smile at someone, this is from the edit of how we relate to uh, people, good manners, uh, this is a beautification. This makes someone else feel happy and, and, and good. This is a way in which we are beautifying ourselves through beautiful conduct. People like that about you. So they are attracted to you from that beautiful action of, uh, of smiling. Or it could be an action of the tongue through speech. All of this has to do with good character uh, characteristics, good conduct. Things that beautify. Beautify you, in essence. Through actions. And Ben Othaymin mentioned something very, very important because a lot of people seem not to comprehend this. And, and so, you know, this again, this is all the introduction before we get into the ahadith. But he says, بينما هي عند الآخرين تخل بالأدب 
بل تجد الأمة أو أمم تتغير أحوالها ففي بعض الأزمان يكون فعل ما يخل بأدب وفي بعض الأزمان نفس الفعل لا يخل بالأدب. So Ibn Uthaymin mentions a very important fight as this great Imam always has the tendency to do in his works. He says that nations or societies that they differ with regards to what they consider to be good manners. It's very important for us. Of course, our good manners and good conduct is in accordance with the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That, that's how we define ours as a nation of Muslims. But we have to realize within that nation of Muslims, we have people from just the Arab Peninsula alone, from Yemen to Saudi Arabia, from the UAE to Bahrain. Okay, they have many adab and uh, issues of conduct that are very similar, but they do have differences. Even in Yemen itself, different parts of Yemen, they have different, some different, slight differences. So what about Yemen to Nigeria? What about Yemen to Indonesia? What about Yemen to America even? The Muslims there, they have their own uh, conduct and so forth. And those things which are within the boundaries of the Sharq, then, then that, that's, that's okay. So they're going to differ. Whereas in one society, doing such and such, drinking tea in a such and such manner, and this Ben Othamin even uses this example, may differ with the way they do it in Burkina Faso, for example, or the way they do it in Ireland. They may have their own, they have their own way of doing certain things. So he's, he's mentioning this uh, uh, and, and, and what may be looked at as negative in one society may not be in another. This is the point he's driving home. Again, within the bounds of the Shara, of course. And he also mentions that you also find that nations change. Nations change. So from those mannerisms we could talk about in dress, for example. Look at now, and as has been asked to the ulama, the issue of pants, of wearing pants. In many Muslim nations before, that wasn't the case. They have been influenced by the West, and they have been influenced, you know, in different, and so on and so forth. And then those of us who came to Islam, that was our, our custom is wearing pants, jeans, and this and that and the other. And as long as those add that, those, those, those habits and those customs and those, those clo that clothing that we wear is not in violation of the shara then it's mubah, then it's permissible. So you will find that within a nation, as we see here in Saudi Arabia, we see the changes from the thobe, which is their uh, traditional wear, that now you, you find in some places where I live, many people don't even wear thobes. You have some, but you see a lot of the youth now know, and even the elders, even they are wearing shorts now. And unfortunately, often not within the bounds of the shara, too short. Showing their aura and stuff. This has become the habit. So it shows us how nations change. And this is the point Ben Arthur Mean is mentioning. That nations change. And it changes what was in the past. May not have been acceptable. Within the same given society. That conduct. That mannerism. That dress. That habit. It, it may now be acceptable. But again. Our ultimate concern. And what is concerned in this text. Is talking about those Sharia manners, what the Shara considers good conduct and good manners, according to the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that shows us that that's a very important point uh, that Ben Rathaymin highlights because we need great Imams like him to recognize this, to understand, and to convey this to the people, so that people don't have misconceptions, say, oh, you know, this is wrong. You're from America, and you guys do this? No. You're from uh, Kenya, and you guys do it like this? No. No, you can't say that. But as long as it's within the context of the shara, 
then those manners they, that particular uh, mannerism or, or manner or custom and it doesn't contradict the shara it's okay it's okay but they may not do that in Saudi Arabia they may not do that in another country or the Philippines that may be looked down on so we have to understand that and that's very important that's from fiqh fi deen that's from understanding the religion and before we get into the ahadith a last uh, couple of points that Ben Ben Baz Wasi I mentioned with regards to uh, this comprehensive book, and he mentions that after having studied the rest of the whole text, with for those who have been able to finish this text with us, may Allah Subhanahu wa Taala accept it from us and bless us with ilm al nafi al-mutaqabbilin. He mentions that after that he says waqad asr al muallif. He said that the, 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 the writer, meaning Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, you know, came up with a very beautiful synthesis or ending for this, uh, for this text. Look at that. That's a Sabil al-Mu'mineen, Sabil al-Salaf al-Saleh. This is the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He said, because a Mu'min, the believer has the greatest need for, uh, regarding these issues. So why is it we have some people who belittle the fact that you need to have good manners in, in Islam, that you should treat one another with goodness, that you should deal with people with, with good manners. Some people, they deny that, and they deny that through their practice. They have the worst manners, and they could change that. And some even believe that they're coming closer to Allah by that wicked by wicked conduct. And this is the point. So here a great Imam of Ahlul Sunnah of this time is, is, is affirming for us that the Mu'min has a great, great need regarding these issues. What issues? The issues of, of, of good manners and the issues contained in this uh, Kitab al-Jama'ah, this comprehensive book. And he says, and for this reason, the he begins with adab, with manners. Yani al adab al shari, and this is what we were talking about before. Sharia manners. Ala the yanbari an yatahalla bihi al mu'min fi akwalihi wa amalihi wa qiyamihi wa qu'udihi wa safarihi wa iqamatihi wa ghayri dhalik. So bin, uh, bin, uh, bin Baz, rahmatullahi, he says that this is this adab al shari, this sharia mannerisms and conduct. This is something which is necessary for the mu'min, the believer, to practice and have in their statements, in their saying, you know, when they speak, in their actions, when they're sitting, when they're standing, when they're traveling, when they're a resident, and other than that. Letting us know that these manners of the shari, we don't abandon them, that this is the sharia, this is Islam. This is the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he mentions another fa'idah. He says, Wa sharia azima al kamila al islamiya al islamiya ja'at bi da'wati ila makaram al akhlaq wa muhasan al a'mal wa tahdir min safasaf al akhlaq wa sayyil a'mal fi jameel ahwal fi rijali wa nisa'i wa jinni wa insi والأغنياءي والفقراء والرؤساء ومرو مرؤسيين. طيب. بن ثيمي بن من باز رحمة الله عليه. He then mentions that the Sharia, this this exalted Sharia, which is uh, you know the completeness of Islam, the complete Islam, it came calling to righteous conduct. So this is this is our job. This is a part of our duty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Righteous manners and excellent deeds and warning against wicked conduct or wicked, wicked manners and evil deeds under all circumstances with regards to men, women, jinn, mankind, the wealthy, the, the poor, the leaders, and those who are ruled by and those who are rule, uh, ruled. And then he ends, before beginning into the ahadith, 
He says, فَيَنْبَغِ لِلْمُؤْمِنِ أَنْ يَتَأَدَّبْ بِالْآدَابِ الَّتِي جَاءَتْ عَنَّ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ وَنْ يَتَخَلَّقَ بِهَا حَتَّى يَتَمَيَّزَ بِذَلِكَ عَنْ غَيْرِهِ So he said that it's an obligation upon the believer to adhere to these excellent mannerisms that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came with to have these manners, this conduct until a person distinguishes himself from other than than, than him hey, meaning the, the disbelievers so this is the part of distinguishing ourselves from disbelief this is a part of exalting the Sharia. This is a part of exalting the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is a part of adherence to the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is a part of the, for someone who wants to say that they follow the Sabila Salaf, Sabila Mu'mineen, Sabila Salaf Asadeh, the Salaf Asadeh, Ahla Athar, Ahla Hadith, then they, they need to adhere to this conduct. Because more importantly, this is the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam. And this is what Islam calls us to. So it's very important that we understand when we study these ahadith that we're going to strive our best to practice them to better our manners and to better understand this, these nusuls, implementing these nusuls, seeking to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's, that's, that's the, 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 the importance of this. And we ask Allah the Almighty to bless us with tawfiq in that. Kitab al -Jami The Comprehensive Book Chapter 1, Good Manners. So in the first hadith of the Prophet وسلم, in this comprehensive uh, book, this comprehensive chapter, or chapter 1, Good Manners, and we already talked about the different segments that this comprehensive book is broken into, uh, Imam Ibn Hajr al-Asqalani, he began with good manners. And so the first hadith deals with the manners that are an obligation upon the Muslim, the rights that Muslims have over one another. And so these are essential manners, good manners, of course, that uh, the Muslim should observe. Narrated Abu Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, <coughs> Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said A Muslim has six duties A Muslim has six duties towards another Muslim When you meet him, greet him with peace Meaning give him salams When he invites you, respond to him When he asks your advice, advise him <clears throat> and when he sneezes and praises Allah, say, may Allah have mercy on you. When he is ill, visit him. And when he dies, follow his funeral. Reported by Muslim. In this uh, authentic hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala where the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, mentioned six rights that a Muslim has uh, over his brother or sister Muslim. And with regards to that, the scholars mention, uh, Bin Uthaymeen mentions specifically, Rahmatullahi alayhi rahmatin wasiyah, he mentions with regards to the statement where the Prophet Sallallahu said, Haqqul Muslim ala Muslim sit. The rights of a Muslim over another Muslim are six. He says that this does not mean it is restricted to six. So that's what's very important for us to understand. And as we progress in our studies, of the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Arabic language will learn more about uh, the usage of the Arabic language and how the Arabs use the Arabic language. And with regards to that, of course, that includes the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who is Arab. And 
in fact, we have this same um, way of using the language uh, in English as well. And in probably in many languages, if not all languages. <coughs> and this is that so sometimes uh, language is used to talk about something, uh, meaning a, a number is used or specified in order to talk about something uh, in approximation. So, for example, in this hadith of the Prophet wasallam, he said, Haqq al-Muslim ala Muslim sit. The rights of a Muslim over another Muslim are six. Does that mean they're not, there's not more than six? No, that's not what that means. And that's what we learn from this hadith because there are many other hadith of the Prophet wasallam which explain that more in detail that, the, that there are other rights that are mentioned uh, in addition to the six that are meant, the six that are mentioned in this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the hadith of Abu Huraira, radiyallahu taala So, that Ibn Uthaymeen mentions that sometimes the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that he would mention things that you know had a specific ruling from amongst the rulings in ahkam and it would be counted exactly so meaning that some things he did specify and they are restricted to that and In this hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he mentioned these six hakuk, these six rights of the Muslim, and he mentioned specific rights. And that with that, though, we have other evidences which increase those rights, and those other evidences come from the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And in one such example, the Messenger of Allah alaihi salatu wasallam said. Uh, or an example, uh, I'm sorry, an example uh, which which illustrates this point is a statement of the Prophet Sallallahu where he said, "Saba yudhillahum Allah fi dhillihi yawma la dhilla illa dhillihi. That seven will be shielded or shaded uh, by the shade, under the shade of Allah, on the day when there will be no shade except his shade. And in other ahadith as well, there are rights mentioned. And with regards to the rights in that hadith, as far as the seven that will be shaded, one of them is the one who loves his brother strictly for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That they love one another for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No other reason. And they come together for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they leave and depart for the sake of Allah azza wa jal. And so the Shaykh is mentioning that sometimes that it is what we learn from this hadith is that it shows the taqrib, you know, this approximation that sometimes the the language you'll find, you'll find in some ahadith of the Prophet wasallam where he mentioned, for example, uh, a specific number, but it may mean other evidences show that what is meant is there are much more. And for example, uh, the hadith of iftirak, the hadith of breaking into sects, where the Prophet ﷺ said, "If tarakat al Yahud ala ithna wa sabain firqa, wa if tarakat al Nasara ala ithna tain wa sabain firqa, wa sataftariku hadhi umma ala thalatha wa sabain firqa, kullaha fi nar ila wahida kulna man hiya ya Rasulullah kala man kana ala mithu ma kana alayhi wa sabi." The Prophet ﷺ said in this hadith, 
he said that the Jews would break into 71 sects and the Christians into 72 sects. And my nation would break into 73 sects, all of them in the fire except one. And so uh, when we look at that hadith, if we were to count, perhaps we would find many more sects, especially amongst the Muslims, especially amongst the Muslims. And in fact, in all of those religious traditions, you'll find that the people, uh, they split and they divided when the Bayina came to them. So when that when the clear message was delivered to them, that's when they began to divide. Wallah musta'an. So with that being the case, uh, the Prophet ﷺ, he gave specific numbers. And that does not mean it is restricted to those numbers. And that's the point that we're trying to illustrate and what's... Uh, Ben Uthameen and, and other ulama mentioned with regards to this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ because in it, he وسلم, said the Muslim rights are six. In another narration, it was mentioned that there were five. Uh, and so, and then we have others that show that there are other rights uh, that we have over one another as believers. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us to fulfill the rights of one another. And what is meant here by the haq of a Muslim, it means that lil Muslim and you taliba akhahu biha. Either lam you di haqahu. So this is very important. What is meant by the right of a Muslim, the right of the Muslim over his Muslim brother or Muslim sister is that that Muslim has a right to ask for this right, to ask for this haq, if they are not given it. So that's what it means when the Prophet ﷺ said, or what meant uh, the haq lil-Muslim. You know, al-Muslim haq al-Muslim, or al-haq al-Muslim al al-Muslim. So this ibarah, this statement, the right of a believer or a right of a Muslim over another Muslim, that means that we can ask for that right from one another because it is something which is bestowed upon us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a right that Allah wa ta'ala has given us so we can ask for that right from our brothers and sisters if they fall short in giving us that haq, that right. And so that's a very important faida and something for us to remember and, and practice. And we'll, we'll find that out with regards to more details in the uh, hadith. And of course, it is well known who the Muslim is. It's the Muslim is the one who testifies that there is no God worthy of worship except the law. And that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam is his last prophet and messenger. And to believe and everything that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came with. And, and of course the Quran was revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and practicing it. And so this is the Muslim. So this is referring to the rights of who? It's referring to the rights of the Muslim. The Muslim over his Muslim brother or Muslim sister. Uh, and The first right that's mentioned in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, "Ida lakaytuhu fasallam alayhi." The Prophet ﷺ said in the beginning of the hadith, he said that if you meet him, meaning if you meet your Muslim brother, uh, then give him salams, give him the salam, the tahiyat al-Islam, the salams, as-salamu alaykum. You know, assalamu alaikum, and you can increase. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, that this is a right that the believer has over his Muslim uh, brother or sister. And some of the other important uh, rights that were mentioned in this hadith 
as the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, said, so he said a Muslim has uh, six duties towards another Muslim. When you meet him, greet him. So that's the first. Greet him. Meaning give salams to your brother. Return salams or give him salams. Uh, when he invites you, respond to him. So if he invites you to something, and we're going to get into all the details, then you should respond to his invitation. That is a haq that he has over you. And we'll talk about some of those details uh, very shortly. Uh, and if he uh, seeks your advice, وَإِذَا إِسْتَنْسَهَكَ فَإِنْسَحْهُ If he requests from you advice, give him advice. This is his haq. It's his right over you. The Prophet ﷺ said, الدين النصيحة the religion is sincere advice. And then he mentioned all the hakuk and the way in which that advice is sincere. And he mentioned from that advice uh, that uh, there is nasiha lillahi wa li kitabihi wa li rasulihi wa li a'immatil Muslimim wa him so that it is to the imams of the Muslims, the leaders, that you should advise the leaders, and you should advise the general people. So this can come in a variety of ways of da'wah, and one of the ways is especially, as we mentioned prior, that if he is requesting. So here the Prophet Sallallahu he mentioned specifically, he said, وَإِذَا أَسْتَنْسَحَكَ If he requests advice from you. So if he asks advice from you, you must give it to him. That's his haq. And the Prophet wasallam also mentioned in that list of rights, he said, and if he sneezes, فَهَمِدَ فشمت فشمته. If he sneezes and uh -huh, and he praises Allah, then say Yarhamakullah. So that right is attained. There's a condition, it's conditional. That he has to say Alhamdulillah. And again, there's some details about that, and we'll, we'll talk about that shortly. And the next right that was mentioned in this hadith, the Prophet said, Wa either marida fu'udhu. The Prophet والسلام, said that if this person, if this believer, if this Muslim becomes sick, if he is sick, then visit him. That's also from his rights. Uh, mata fet, fet if he dies, then follow his funeral procession. So those are the six rights that are mentioned in this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. With regards to the fawaid, the benefits of this hadith, and there are many. From amongst those benefits is this hadith clarifies for us the haquq or the rights the believers have over one another. This is very important because how do we know this? It's not just something intrinsic. Intrinsically, yes, we have we have an idea, we, we feel we have rights over one another, but this specifies for us, according to the shara, what is my brother's right over me? You know, this, this gives us that knowledge in ilm. It comes from ta'lim, it comes from learning, it comes from uh, studying the book of Allah and studying the sunnah, the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And this is why we see in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam where he said, May yarid Allahu bihi khayran yufaqo fi deen. Whenever Allah wants good for a person, he gives them understanding of the religion. So that's a great ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those people who are, of course, the ulama, first and foremost. Because they are the most God-fearing. They fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most. Al ulama, and those people who are on their path, meaning you know the the scholars that are less than them, and the talabat al ilm, the real talab al ilm, those who are seeking knowledge and practicing, that they 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has favored them and given them something from fiqh fi deen that's a favor from him and that shows his love for him. But if they're not practicing and they become the ulama of bid'ah and the ulama of su, the ulama of evil and spreading evil and not practicing what they preach, wallahu musta'an, they, that may be a test for them. It may not be a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love for them. Because if they are given knowledge and then they increase in misguidance, then it, rather it's a test for them. So that is a very uh, important point with regards to the knowledge. So we gain the knowledge of these haquq, of these rights, from the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as we mentioned, we mentioned those six uh, that are mentioned in this hadith. Another uh, benefit or fa'ida of this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam is that Muslims have rights over one another which affirm their brotherhood for one another. And it makes them firm. So, for example, the fact that you have those people who should be looking out for you and giving you at least these minimal rights of giving you salams and so forth, this should be uh, an affirmation of your faith, number one, and an affirmation of your brotherhood. Uh, another benefit, you know, because this is, establishes that that sila, that that relationship between, uh, you know, the akhwa to imaniya, the is the the uh, Islamic brotherhood, for a lack of better words. Another benefit of this hadith is it shows us that from the rights of a Muslim over his brother, is that when he meets him, to give him salams. And the Sheikh mentions that this haq, this right, is not uh, an obligation, meaning not an obligation under all circumstances. And he said the evidence for that is uh, another narration of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is that he excused a person when they're making hajr of one another, when they are avoiding giving salams to one another. Uh, and this is for a period up to three days when it comes to uh, affairs of the dunya. And this is in accordance with the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, because he sallallahu rabbi wasallamu alaihi said, "La yuhillu li Muslim an yahjara akhahu fuk thalathi layal yaltaqiani fi yaradu hada wa yaradu hada wa khairuhum aladi yabdau bil salam." The Prophet alaihi salatu wasallam said. It's not permissible for a Muslim to avoid or make hajr of his brother more than three nights. So if they meet one another and this one uh, rejects this one and this one rejects that one, the, the better of them is the one who begins the salam. So the best from amongst them is the one who begins the salams and they begin to open up that right again. So from this is that Ben Arthimeen mentioned, so we need to clarify what I just said. He said, So he said that based upon this hadith, that beginning with the salams, being the first to give the salams, is not an obligation. As, uh, as long as the individuals have not reached the level 
to where they're making, they're excommunicating one another, meaning that they are no longer giving salams to one another. So it's very important for us to understand uh, Uh, and this brings up another a mas'ala that Ben Uthaymin, he mentions. He said, well, what about the right, uh, you know, between the sexes, a, a Muslim man and a Muslim woman that are not, uh, that they don't know one another. So he, sa he mentions that the asal is, of course, as long as there isn't fitna, you know, as long as there isn't going to be a test and going to be, you know, they're going to mix and they're going to get excessive and begin to communicate, you know, and and it's going to cause a fitna and, and, and lead to muharramat, then that this is, it's, it's okay. Because this is from Islam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was, uh, you know, this is general, a Muslim uh, over a Muslim. And there were women who gave salams and asked questions to the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam. Uh, another benefit of this hadith, another faida, is this hadith affirms for us because the Prophet ﷺ said, Hakul Muslim ala Muslim. He said that these are the rights of the Muslim. That means these are not the rights of a non Muslim as far as giving the salams. That they are not included in this because this is the right of the believer. This is uh, one of those signs. Of Islam that distinguishes the believers from the disbelievers and it is this great greeting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, legislated for us uh, another benefit of this hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam is uh, the the Shaykh mentions is that this hadith also shows us that it's mutlaq salam, meaning that the salam is general. It, it doesn't have to have a specific way of giving salams. Okay, you can say salamu alaikum or salamu alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh or however that you give the salams, you return the salams that are mentioned, especially uh, with the, uh, in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the scholars have some differences with regards to this um, and the, te the, the, the greeting between one another. And there are uh, also uh, athar mentioned on the Sahaba and the Salaf, Ridwan Allahi alayhim, with regards to giving the salams and, 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 and some of the increasing of the uh, way in which a person gives salams. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is it shows us that the better person and the one who is superior in regards to this in, in their illustration of Iman is the one who begins with the salams. That this is better. It's better for you. And that is in accordance with the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there's other ahadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, for example, uh, give salams to those you know and those you don't know. So we learn from this and other narrations that it's better to begin with the salams and that not to be stingy with your salams. You know, give the salams. And this increase, and as we mentioned, and we already mentioned prior to this, is that giving the salams, it spreads love. It, it causes you, as a messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, said, that it, it makes you, uh, by giving salams, if, if you want to uh, increase the love between you, then spread the salams. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us that if one of your Muslim brothers invites you to, uh, you know, to, to come and, and, and eat with them, that you should, you know, to come to their walima or whatever the case may be, then you should uh, attend if you, of course, are able. And most of the ulama mention that it is not an obligation except for the situation of the Wilima. And 
as uh, so what's implied here is of course that the scholars they differ with regards to this but this is one of the haquq this is a haq as a messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam uh, mentioned and in this regard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in another uh, narration he said وَمَنْ لَمْ uh, uh, يَجِبْ uh, دَعْوَةَ فَقَدْ عَصَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ فَقَدْ عَصَى اللَّهَ وَرَسُولُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ uh, that the one who does not answer the call after they've been invited, meaning that they don't uh, go to the invitation that they were invited, then they've disobeyed Allah and His Messenger. So that's very strong nus there. And for some, that's a hujjah, that, that it's an obligation to give that, uh, to, to um, answer, you know, to... to to come to someone's, uh, if they call you and invite you, to come to their uh, walima, their wedding festival, or what have you. Uh, some of the details with regards to this haq is that, for example, if it's a, a, a walima in which there's going to be mixing, there's going to be muharramat, they have music, they have disco lights, they have a band, you know, whatever, they have things which are impermissible, uh, for the Muslim, then it is not an obligation upon you to attend that one. So if they are inviting you, although they have a haq over you, that haq is negated if there's muharramat, if it's going to, you know, they're serving alcohol, they're serving muharramat, you don't have to attend that. Uh, likewise, uh, for, for other activities where there's going to be muharramat. So then that, in essence, that... Uh, negates having to attend but in regards to that if a person goes and they have the ability uh to enjoin the good and forbid the evil and have that effect then then in that situation maybe it may be even an obligation for them to attend because they have the ability to stop that munkar and this is in accordance with the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu the hadith of Abi Sa'id al-Khudri radiyallahu ta'ala anhu where he said sami'tu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqul man ra'a minkum munkaran falyughayiruhu bi yad fa in lam yastati' fa bi lisanihi fa in lam fa in lam yastati' fa bi qalbihi wa dhalika adafu liman rawahu Muslim in the hadith in Sahih Muslim the hadith of Abi Sa'id al-Khudri radiyallahu ta'ala anhu where he said i heard the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam say that whoever sees a munkar, then change it with his hand. If he's unable to do, then change it with his tongue, meaning speak out against it. And if he's unable to do that, then change it with his heart. And that's the weakest form of faith. Letting us know that changing the munkar in all those ways is a part of faith. And letting us know that iman is comprised of statements of the tongue, belief in the heart, actions of the limbs. All of that makes up iman. And that is from Iman, if a person goes and attends one of those things, and they are able to enjoin the good and forbid the evil, that they, uh, maybe the people really respect them, and so they turn off the music. Maybe the people respect them, and so the women go to their side, and the men go to their side. Whatever the case may be, or the person has great status, and the people respect them, then, uh, yes, then that uh, would be a situation in which them attending that munkar, would be, there would be maslaha in that. Another benefit of this hadith uh, is it shows us that whoever from amongst the, the Muslims, regardless whether they are somebody of great status or somebody of little status, that you should come uh, as you were invited, because the Prophet ﷺ said, "Wa ida da'aka fa'ajibhu." He didn't. He, so, so if you are invited, then uh, attend. You know, then 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 come and, and accept the invitation. And he did not restrict it and mention anything with regards to whether someone is high in status, when someone low in status, whatever the case may be, old in age, uh, or 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 young. Another benefit of this hadith is it also shows us the obligation to give advice uh, when asked. That this is an obligation upon 
uh, that the, your Muslim brothers and sisters have over you to advise them. So that's a good reminder for us to be, uh, you know, active in giving advice to our brothers and sisters, especially when asked to do so. Another benefit of this hadith is that if <clears throat> that if a person sneezes, to uh, and and then there's a shart with that. So if a person sneezes and then says, uh, and then hamidullah, then they say alhamdulillah, then you give them, uh, then you say yarhamakullah. You say may Allah uh, have mercy upon you. And with regards to this, uh, we understand the mafhum of this hadith and this is another faida that if someone does not say alhamdulillah then you do not have to uh, say yarhamakullah to them <clears throat> and And there are other ahadith uh, which mention this and affirm this hukum for us. Uh, another benefit of this hadith that's mentioned is that it's also permissible to leave that which is a beloved action, which might be recommended or something. So, for example, and the example is given and, and where this hukum is derived or this principle is derived is because the Prophet ﷺ made it a condition and said, uh, Fahamida. So if the you know the person praises Allah with it. So meaning if they don't praise, then it's permissible to leave off saying Yarhamakullah to them. Uh, and of course, if there is a maslaha, even if they didn't, maybe from the Baba Ta'ali, maybe they don't know the ruling. Or just as a reminder, you can also say Yarhamakullah. Uh, and that is from goodness. And especially if there is a maslaha, you know, you're teaching them or you're reminding your brother or sister of this important uh, haq and this important uh, act of ibadah that uh, is mashroor on the tongue of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us that it is from the rights of the Muslim over his brother to visit him if he is sick. And with regards to that, this uh, is in regards to a sickness that where he is bedridden or, you know, he's in the hospital or something. doesn't mean he just has a common cold and he's, uh, you know, or he has a scar or he's you know, hurt his finger or something like this, and then you visit, maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you just for that anyway. But the, the meaning of the hadith and the implication of the hadith, as the scholars mentioned, is that if someone has a, you know, they, they're, they're really sick, you know, they're sick and they're at home, they're in the bed, they're sick, they're in the hospital, something similar to this, then to visit them. And the final right that was mentioned in this hadith, which is also a one of the fawaid, is that if the Muslim uh, passes, then uh, uh, then to to follow their uh, janazah. And this uh, the ittiba janaz or ittiba janaza is fard al kifaya, meaning it's an obligation that is fulfilled as long as someone from the community uh, fill, fulfills that duty. So that is a great right your brother has over you and you will be rewarded tremendously by doing so. And and it benefits the one in the grave, bi'idhnillah ta'ala. However, it is a, it is fard, it is an obligation, but it's kifai, meaning that as long as some Muslims do it, the sin is removed from others. So that's very important for us to understand that as long as someone is bearing the, the, the brother or the sister, then the rights, the sin is removed 
from the rest of the community. So that's very, very important uh, for us to uh, have that, uh, that understanding. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil and bless us to be of those who give one another their rights. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.